Hello everyone, this is the commentated review to ELA Day 2. Uh, once again, of course, some of the really cool things I got to see are a bit harder to uh, edit through the footage. They're, they're not really hard to edit, but it's, it's a bit more than I can do on the one with a laptop on a hotel room floor. So while I did do some very light editing, most of the videos I'm uploading during ELA already are just uh, cl single clips that I could just directly upload from my camera and they'd look fine. So the previews you see, they're, they're not really highlights in the sense that they're the best parts, although some of them are really cool, but they're really more ranked by how easy they were to find and edit. So once again, I'll uh, go through in a one commented video with uh, more or less random footage in the background, uh, just to give you a bit of an actual preview of what actually happened, regardless of how easy the footage is to find or edit, just the most interesting things that happened in chronological order. So day two yesterday started incredibly interestingly with something that will take a long time to edit, unfortunately, because there was a panel on the Ariane 6 development. And that panel was in German, so for most of my viewer I will have to subtitle it, which is going to take a very long time. Or not really incredibly long, but longer than one evening on a laptop, so I'll have to upload that panel after ELA. So here's a quick review summary of what happened, uh, although mixed in with some other information I got from uh, talking without recording. The Ariane 6 is making good progress. It's uh, scheduled to launch in 2020 for the first time. Now it does seem that it was a little bit optimistically planned in the beginning, so now as it gets a bit more detailed it starts to lose a tiny bit of performance, but it's still performing well enough for what it was intended for. But uh, most of all, its its main point isn't that it performs better than the Ariane 5, its main point is that it's more flexible. Uh, the obvious part being that it can be flown with four or with two boosters, which uh, allows it to uh, have a cheaper version with less payload capacity or a more expensive version with more payload capacity. So if you have a relatively small payload, you don't have to... Uh, use an unsuitable overkill rocket and you don't have to get the payload small enough to fit on a much smaller rocket either so that basically just buys more efficiency since you basically save two boosters if the payload is small enough what's uh, much more interesting is the uh, reliability of the upper stage engine which was highlighted during the talk which uh, also uh, has enough delta V that you can insert satellites directly into geostationary orbit instead of uh, just into a geostationary transfer orbit and then having the satellites circularize themselves with their thrusters. But what's also kind of interesting is that uh, a lot of development is being done now to uh, basically make the Ariane 7 and yeah that's already a bit of a discussion since uh, often the, the concepts for Ariane rockets were often designed before the previous rocket had ever even flown, it's a relatively long development span. But they're basically trying to imitate some of the ideas of SpaceX, so uh, for once they're developing a relatively small versatile rocket engine which uh, could be uh, clustered together and uh, so one concept sees a rocket first stage with seven engines, one in the center and six around it, and then an upper stage using one of the same engine, just a slightly modified for vacuum use, which of course makes manufacturing much easier since you have only one type of rocket engine and you build many small rocket engines. And they also have a model of a first stage landing demonstrator. This isn't an actual operational first stage. It's called Callisto. It's more of a, a demonstrator that first stage landings with their technology can work. And it looks a little bit like a Falcon 9 and basically mirrors the grasshopper. Though they are not really just imitating SpaceX, so there might be some actual competition in the future since they are also working on some different technologies. For example, they are still focusing on LH2 locks or liquid hydrogen and oxygen as fuels. 
After the Area in 6 panel, I spent a bit more time in the halls and uh, saw a few more interesting companies and interesting projects, though uh, too much to just briefly summarize here. I uh, then got to fly in a Eurofighter flight simulator with a completely built cockpit. That's the engineering simulator with a relatively realistic flight model. I couldn't film the whole session, but I did get some pictures of the simulator itself. We then did get to see some interesting displays, like the restored historic World War II airplane EL-2. But a few displays were also scrubbed for weather reasons. The weather wasn't as horrible as the day before, but it kept mediocre for a very long time, so there was a lot of display downtime. I did use that time though to look into some of the airplanes on static display. A sonar submarine hunter which was quite fascinating because it combined a lot of old and new technology. The plane itself was pretty old and the instruments that just worked perfectly fine were never replaced, but uh, some parts also got completely modernized for better performance. So you have a literal needle paper, I'm not perfectly sure how to call that thing in English, but it's it's basically a needle pen on a voltmeter and a paper is dragged below it. It's basically like those vintage earthquake detection or EEG systems that you might see in old science fiction movies. So it's literally a mechanical pen that the machine moves while dragging a paper underneath it to record a graph and right next to it there are a few large touchscreen displays for some of the modernized instruments. And another huge highlight was the Airbus and DLR research airplane, which you could already see yesterday from the cockpit of a C-17. Now the airplane is an Airbus A340 but heavily modified because they're testing a new wing design and they don't know how that well that will work. So what they de basically did was they took a relatively small wing, basically they built a new Airbus A320 wing based on that new technology and they strapped it to the tip of an A340 wing and the idea is that the A340 is so much larger compared to that wing that if that revolutionary wing's wing turns out to completely fail, the aircraft can still be safely controlled and landed because it's so much larger than that little test wing. And what they test though is a laminar flow technologies including coating but also a new geometries and manufacturing techniques that allow to keep the airflow over the wing laminar for a much longer time before turning into a turbulent flow which would reduce the friction of the wing's surface by a lot and since that is only a small part of the airplane's drag that would only increase the airplane's efficiency by about 5% at first. But of course if you redesigned and re-optimized an airplane with that idea in mind you could reach a lot more than 5% fuel savings since you could give the airplane bigger wings, knowing that they cause less friction than before. That would mean you could use less angle of attack, you could fly higher or slower and cause less otherwise drag. Well, overall airplane optimization is pretty complicated, lots of factors interacting with each other that have to be mathematically connected and simplified to find one somewhat optimized solution for a very specific purpose. I might make a video about this later, but for now this is really oversimplified. But I think that overall in, in the long run this technology could probably save some 20% fuel or so rather than just 5%. Though again, the results are not completely in yet, we don't know how well exactly the technology is working. It seems to be working somewhat well, but they're still changing it, still testing it, still improving it. These wings have to be very clear and almost perfect, so they have to use very special surfaces that uh, reject water and dirt, because any dirt particle will also cause a switch from laminar to turbulent flow. There was a long tour through the airplane and a lot of explanations of the technology itself, as well as the sensors they used to verify it, which I will edit together as soon as I find the time.
And with that, Ila was already over. Now for today, the weather looks a lot better. It's uh, sunny and clear outside. There will probably be an astronaut talking about his experience in space, as well as a lot of airshow program, of course, a few uh, relatively impressive demonstrations. That couldn't be done yesterday. It will also be the last of the exclusive days. The next days after that will be public. So, of course, I'll try to sit in a lot of aircraft cockpits without having to wait in a queue for an hour. So, yeah, that was day two of ELA. Now going out for day three of five. If you have any questions or requests, I'm always open. Although now I won't be able to read them until day four. I'll hopefully manage to interview a Eurofighter pilot then, so stay tuned, and as always, thanks for watching.